What if a simple walk could change your life forever? On the Camino de Santiago, it just might. Are you ready to see the Camino through a pilgrim's eyes and discover if the Camino's magic is real? I'm Storysteller, and for 40 days, I've captured every unfiltered moment of this life-changing pilgrimage on the Camino Frances, documenting its power to transform the body, the mind, and the soul. From breathtaking sunrises to exhausted late-night confessions in albergues, join me as we discover the transformative power an 800-kilometer trek has on those who choose to walk this ancient pilgrimage. I captured my journey through video and narration, uploading my video diaries to YouTube for my bunk bed in albergues or hostels each night. My goal was to convey the immersive experience of the Camino and the impact it has on each and every pilgrim. By recording my narration while walking, I was able to capture my honest and unfiltered response to the experience of walking the Camino. My hope is that, compared to my previous Camino documentaries, this series comes even closer to capturing the true essence of this epic journey across Spain. The question you need to ask is, did I succeed? Can walking for over a month truly change a person's entire world? Watch my Camino diaries and decide. So I'm on a train, taking the red eye to Paris, and then on to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port. It's a day and a half, or a day plus one night of crossing Europe. And of course, I'm thinking, why are you going on a third Camino? To me, it's a great example of how memory plays games with you. Memory is always an interpretation of what actually happened. It is rarely, if ever, objective. And the further away something is, the more the glasses of retrospection become rosy. We forget the hard things, the unpleasant things. We tune them out and we remember the nice things, mostly. And because I have this great sense of anticipation for my next Camino, for my third Camino. And I know that the Camino is a master of confounding your expectations. I'm super excited to be going. I've been dreaming of the Camino and um, it's just kind of become a big part of my life. So yes, I have my expectations and some of them will be fulfilled and others will not. And there will be many moments where I think to myself, why am I doing this? It's not like I have to prove to myself that I can walk across a country. I've done it. And yet, there's something that makes me want to do it again, which is why I'm on this train. on my way to France, to cross the Pyrenees, to Spain. 
I am excited. I'm really looking forward to this. With the good and the bad, I'm curious to see what happens. I'm also going to try this new format of regular posts from the road. Rough, raw, and barely edited. Isn't the immediacy of things as they happen, isn't that the interesting thing? So I'm very curious to find out. And uh, maybe you're curious too. So smash that subscribe button, as they say. Hit that like button if you want. I'll see you here, or I won't, but I'm on my way. See you there. So here I am again, about to climb the Pyrenees for a third time in as many years. The Camino is funny because after completing it, it kind of fades into the background and your brain processes it quietly. But it's only later that you start to realize what it all meant. And then it creeps up on you again, slowly at first, and then with increasing force. And you start to think, I can't possibly walk another time, can I? But then you realize that, well, you can. And you start making movies in your mind about what it would be like to take on that walk again. And before you can fully comprehend it, you're on the train to Paris again. And now here I am, Saint Jean Pied de Port, and it feels familiar almost. Although I've never spent much time here. But it's been the starting point for a great adventure twice over now. Deeply familiar in a way, but also perpetually novel. Once again, it feels like the Camino is a mirror reflecting back the fundamental impermanence that goes through all aspects of our lives. So of course I need to manage my expectations. And I also feel some cognitive dissonance. I want to feel like I'm doing it for the first time. I want to be open to all that can and will happen. But it's always the first time. Even if you walk the Camino multiple times, that's why people do it, I guess. It will not be a repeat of your previous Camino, and it shouldn't be. New people, new circumstances, new weather, new blisters, new everything. Don't come here expecting an encore.
to cling to expectations or to seek to recreate the past is to deny the very essence of life's mystery. So walking it again is like a call to cultivate a beginner's mind free from the shackles of preconceptions and ripe with wonder and possibility. Each Camino is a unique journey, a fresh painting waiting to be painted with new experiences, insights and memories. So I've got to remind myself to embrace the novelty, the uncertainty, and the ever-changing nature of this pilgrimage. Since it's in the unknown that we truly discover ourselves in the world around us. True experience often blooms in the fertile soil of uncertainty. So let's see what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I will go walk that mountain again. See you there. Six twenty in the morning. The birds are starting to sing. Walking up the Pyrenees, it's steep and it's stormy. We're being blown away here. It's crazy stormy. So not only have to walk against the inclination of the mountain, but also against the storm hitting you in the face. But it's beautiful. It's so stormy. It's crazy. So you not only have to go against the inclination, but also against the storm hitting your whole body fighting you back down. But it's gloriously beautiful. So it's all right. I'm now getting closer to the peak of the Pyrenees. And it's raining. And the wind is beating the rain hard on my face. But uh, the worst is that my legs are really cramping up. I mean, in a major way. They've started doing that recently, but, but this is pretty bad. Um, so it's either a colossal lack of magnesium or potassium or water or lack of muscle, I don't know, or something else. It does worry me, especially for the way down to Roncesvalles, because I think walking down is even harder with cramps. 
It's like my body's saying, hello. In a big way. So I hope, I hope I can walk. If you can even hear me over this wind. It's a storm. This third crossing of the Pyrenees was, without a doubt, the most challenging yet. The unforgiving weather compounded my physical challenges and pushed me to my absolute limits. Something I did not expect. But once I was on that steep decline to Roncesvalles, and my legs didn't give in or seize, I knew they would carry me through. The day was an intense physical battle, far more than I had anticipated. But such unexpected trials are a classic part of the Camino experience. Now that I'm having a coffee after a warm shower, the physical demands are already receding in the rear view mirror. I'm utterly shot. But tomorrow's a new day. I know I will take that on too. Today I need to discuss the importance of humility and the dangers of pride. I took on this Camino with grand ambitions, eager to dive into various philosophical and psychological topics. What I had on my mind was a somewhat cerebral but leisurely stroll across Spain. I even displayed that almost cocky attitude to first-timers on the Camino. On my first two Caminos, I had the luxury of my body just working. I never felt any serious pain, and its stamina was exceptional. And within my Camino family, the running joke was that I just don't get any injuries or that I'm not forced to feel any pain. And that this was unfair because everybody feels pain on the Camino eventually. So what an incredible luxury to enjoy. My cavalier attitude to this arduous walk was so exquisite that I didn't even bother to take walking poles this time. Well, the joke's on me, because this time my body is most certainly making itself felt. I have been in pain since almost the beginning. That first day, the tough climb of the Pyrenees that led to cramping legs. So every step now comes with a noticeable dose of pain, which in turn affects my hiking technique and has even led to a knee injury. I'm now walking with a double jeopardy. I know that this too shall pass, but it definitely defines the experience so far. 
so I have neither the time nor the means to philosophize or think about all that much to begin with. All I'm trying to do is limp my body to the next destination. And I'm very happy if I manage to. I'm usually the one passing everyone else. I like to walk fast. And now I'm forced to slow down considerably. I now get passed by almost everyone. But that also gives me the opportunity to really appreciate this particularly beautiful leg of the Camino that up to now I've almost run through or sprinted through. So I'm now eating some humble pie with a side of painkillers. And I probably deserve it, says the rooster. And my slowness also gives me the unique opportunity to walk across this beautiful forest by myself again. The last time I did this was during my 100 kilometer in 24 hours to Santiago. The only difference was that my body then was at the peak of its capabilities, which today it very much isn't. But knowing the Camino, I should have expected something like this. Once again, I was served the exact opposite of what I wanted or expected. A painfully physical way to demonstrate the impermanence of all things. Knowing that I'm learning a lesson somewhat helps with giving me perspective To the pain. This also means that on the advice of an orthopedist, my mom, I decided to skip today's leg to Pamplona to give my knee a rest and not put my entire Camino at risk. So for the first time, I'll be taking the bus for one stage of the Camino. So here's the simple yet pertinently clear lesson for today. Don't take your body for granted, or anything really. Arrogance always comes at a cost. And pride will get the better of you if you don't keep it in check. Life always has surprises in store that you didn't expect. So if you'd like more of this, subscribe and come walk with me.
Hola. ¿Pamplona? Sí, para pronto, por favor. Voy a hacer. I'm sitting in Café Irunia, that legendary café where Hemingway used to drink and write. And it's just a very nice hangout by, by the big plaza in Pamplona. And I'm sitting here and thinking about an encounter I just had with Jeff from North Carolina. I was sitting on the big plaza earlier, Plaza del Castillo, and some guy comes up to me and chats me up and says, hey, I've seen your movies on YouTube. So we start a conversation and, you know, talk about this and that. And he was on his way to Saint-Jean-Pied-de-Port to start his own Camino. So we talk about expectations and, you know, ideals and assumptions about the Camino. And Jeff said, the only thing I expect of the Camino is that my feet will hurt, my legs will ache, and I'll get blisters. Everything else is open and optional. His words really struck a chord within me because they encapsulated the very essence of the Camino experience. A journey not defined by the destination, but by the unscripted moments that happened along the way. And in that simple statement, Jeff had managed to distill the wisdom that so many pilgrims discover through the long and sometimes transformative process of walking the Camino. And if I'm being honest, I also felt a little caught out because I can philosophize about the theory of the pilgrimage all I want. About being open to the experience and letting go of expectations. And yet, the very fact of me sitting there with an injured knee was the very result of expectations I've had and assumptions I had made. But the Camino had a pretty immediate way of dispensing of any of those. And it has made that very clear. So as I listened to Jeff share his simple and true perspective, I was, of course, reminded of the Taoist concept of Wei Wu Wei the art of effortless action, or doing by not doing, of which the Camino is seemingly the living embodiment of. And I seem to have ignored that very thing that I think about so much, which is why I'm injured. It all makes sense, and it doesn't, but it's... It's ironic or whatever you want to call it. For many, the Camino de Santiago represents a quest for spiritual enlightenment or a physical challenge to be conquered or a means of escaping the monotony of everyday life. And while all these motivations are certainly valid and often lead to profound personal growth, 
it's the unplanned moments that truly define the Camino experience. These are the moments that transcend the physical demands of the journey. They're kind of unexpected gifts and have nothing to do with a physical challenge. Because when you embark on the Camino, you're forced to confront the limitations of your own control and the humbling reality that the universe often has other plans, as I'm finding out right now. Blisters, aching muscles, injured knees, or bad weather conditions, they become constant and certain companions, reminding us that the path ahead is not ours to dictate. It's in this very surrender of control that the Camino's greatest gifts are found. By letting go of the need to plan, predict, and micromanage every step of the way, we open ourselves up to the serendipitous encounters the unexpected discoveries and the insights that can only arise when one is truly present and open to what the moment has to offer. And these lessons are not unique to the pilgrimage. These are old, timeless wisdoms of philosophers and mystics and sages across the ages and cultures. So as I bid farewell to Jeff from North Carolina, and as I'm hopefully able to continue on my own communion tomorrow, I couldn't help but feel a renewed sense of gratitude and wonder for the wisdom that this pilgrimage continues to offer. What are the odds that some guy on the internet sees the videos of some other guy on the internet and they run into each other in a big city in Spain and have a meaningful exchange? I didn't even have a take, I didn't even take a picture of him. I didn't even take a picture of him or exchange emails. Very untypical of me. So I think Jeff was absolutely right. The only thing you can expect of the Camino is that your feet will hurt your legs will ache and that you'll get blisters. Everything else is open and optional. So Jeff, if you're out there and are able to hear this or not, one Camino. And you can be certain of all those things, like you said. And maybe many more things too.
The pilgrim's predicament. Do I walk the Camino or do I go to the bar? Gracias. Bueno, gracias. Gracias, vamos a firmar aquí. As you've seen earlier, spring is such an explosion of sound and color. It's such a beautiful thing and I can't just walk past it. So I'm constantly falling behind because there's something beautiful that demands to be recorded. And it's when you try to really listen that you notice how much sound pollution there is. The constant hum drone of cars is almost everywhere and yet the wind and the birds fight valiantly to be heard i gotta be honest though the most jarring intrusion upon this natural opera comes from the very pilgrims who walk this path those groups engaged in ceaseless chatter at volumes that carry for miles. To be clear, I also love the joy of companionship and the exchange of stories with fellow travelers. But when the struggle to escape the incessant chatter becomes a constant and either accelerating or falling back in the futile attempt to find a moment of tranquility, you can't help but wonder. So when I pause to capture the oral landscape, this reality becomes kind of undeniable. Not a minute passes without groups of people crossing the frame, with their voices carried on the wind and the shrill metallic clacking of the walking poles just adding another dissonant thing to it. 
But I'm not one to lecture and I too am one of those people. And everybody should do as they please. But at times I wish for a greater sense of quiet and maybe respect for those who seek some solitude while you're walking. And so I have deliberately slowed my pace, not only due to the demands of my knee, but also to fully appreciate the spectacle that nature has gifted us today. The celebratory cerveza at arrival will taste no less refreshing if I arrive two hours later. And I'm also finding out how much less taxing a slower pace is. In the comments Danielle and Sia suggested, I send my backpack ahead to ease the burden on my knee. And that was a great idea. I hadn't even considered it before, although it's such a simple one. So that's what I did. And my knee seems to be recovering, which is quite a relief because I was quite worried. So the great weather, the recovering knee, they lift my spirits. And it would all be perfect if it wasn't for the fact that the knee brace is probably going to give me a suntan like a zebra, but something's got to give. And to top off a fine day, my friend Dan from the great channel Camino Hacks sent me a message just minutes before reaching a great spot for a wild swim. It was already late in the day, so just as I had found the emptiness I was craving, I also got to jump into the cold water after a long walk. So thanks, Dan. That was a great one. So if you want more of this, subscribe and come walk along with me. I'm walking to Los Arcos today. It's a shorter one. Which is good because I'm starting to feel my knee again. I just took my last diclofenac, which is a bit worrying. But I think if I take it easy, I hope I'll be fine because the truth is no knee, no camino. So I'm being extra cautious. It felt better yesterday. But uh, yeah, that's how these things go. You gotta be careful. But it suits me to go slower, to stop and listen to the birds. Listen. Stupid truck. But DJ Bird is in the house. And he's constantly giving a nice concert. And DJ Color Crazy is also in the fields. It's great to look at. So I'm also questioning whether my best laid plans of booking some places ahead. If I just, I should just throw them in the garbage bin. I did it because I don't want to be on the phone comparing places to book and I just didn't want that stress because it's annoying. So knowing the stages and how far I can go per day, it was a good idea. And I like to not have to worry about booking these things. 
I'm starting to consider cancelling it all and just take it day by day. Really just wing it and see what happens. Taking some speed out, letting myself fall behind on purpose. I don't know yet. I'm thinking about this because what's the rush? I've not made a decision. I could go either way. I also think it's a good idea to keep the momentum. And I don't think I would be pondering this if my body was in full force. But it isn't. So wishful thinking doesn't help. I'm really on the fence. But that's how it is walking the Camino. You just don't know what's going to happen. And that's what's so interesting about it. Because either way, it will be good. Falling back would also mean mixing up the social circle a little because I would meet people that have started a little later from Saint Jean Pied de Port, which could be interesting because you meet so many interesting people and that would just add to the circle of people I could meet. Even though I'm on a bit of a solitary quest here, I still enjoy the company of others. Just maybe not all the time. So yeah, that's the kind of thing I think about while I'm walking through this beautiful spring landscape. It's now noon. I still have not found breakfast. The place in Estella where I thought I could get breakfast was closed. And uh, the only place I found afterwards was a bar with an Asian travel group and really bad 70s trash disco blasting. I'm sorry, but I'm hungry, but I'm not that hungry. I'd rather starve than deaden my senses in that establishment. Uh, yeah, there's a few pet peeves I will need to talk about in an upcoming episode. I might not make a whole lot of friends with it, but so be it. There are pet peeves. And it's not with the full-on pilgrims who walk from Saint Jean Pied de Port to Santiago. Those are all a fellowship in a way. But there are others which I will not get into right now. But I have thoughts, let's put it that way. It's funny, in many ways, my third Camino is very different than my first two. And I kind of had a feeling it would be. I didn't expect the injury, but the other stuff, the stuff in the brain, in the heart. 
I kind of had a feeling it would be different. The social thing. It's good that it is. Because why would you want to do the same thing over? Even though it might have been great. It's different. Very different. And if you like exploration, this is exactly what you want. Because it's new, even though you're on familiar terrain, but it's entirely new. And isn't that what you want? I do. I'm still forming my thoughts about all this. And it's way too early to, you know, assign a character or something to the Camino, to this Camino. It's like about day five or six now. I think six. You forget about time anyway. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week it is, nor do I care. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to see the contrast between the Caminos. And that's what makes it so good. That's magic. You may have noticed how my videos are less of a linear narrative like they used to be and have turned into more of a internal monologue, if you will. It's more about what I think about the Camino or the kind of thoughts it inspires than about what it is we do in the Camino. Both things are very valid, but for some reason I felt like exploring this other avenue. I don't even know who I'm making these videos for, except myself. And some people watch them and like them, so that's good. Making these videos is my method for processing life, I guess. Which also means they're very subjective. in my point of view. And they're stories. Life is a story. And stories need to be told. And every story is individual. But every story is also universal. There are reasons why Old stories like the Odyssey have endured over millennia. And not that my story matters at all. But, you know, something, something that I like to do, and I put it on YouTube for whatever reason. It's a good platform for this kind of thing. But it's almost like the videos have become a backdrop to the narration. They illustrate the narration, but it's the narration itself that's in the foreground. Which for me is new because I work in visuals. 
and visuals are my thing. But somehow combining them with words yields interesting results. It adds a layer, even though it takes another away. I'm just experimenting and winging it. I have no goal. I just want to do this for whatever reason. Just make it interesting. That's all that matters. So if you're interested in where this could go, because I sure don't know, subscribe and come walk along with me on the Camino of Santiago. It's an absolutely beautiful day on day seven for a long walk to Logroño. I have another hour and a half ahead and my knee seems pretty happy and so I'm quite content with the momentum that I have right now. So I think for the next few days at least I'll just stick to the bookings that I have and just ease into this rhythm. I haven't even bothered to look at the distances of the daily stages. They just are what they are. It's not like I'm going to change them. So walking with less data points in your mind is liberating. And turns the hours of walking into a, a beautiful drone sound that just is. And then suddenly you're there. And it seems to have been quite easy. By stopping to think about time or distance, they start to lose power over you. They're just another thing. The distance will be covered once it's covered. And you will be there when you get there. It's that simple, really. My next evolutionary leap, of course, will be when I don't even know the destination I'm walking to. But I'm not there yet. Serendipity is a beautiful thing that flourishes best in liberty. I used to track my physical progress precisely with my digital devices, recording distances and footsteps, average speeds, calories, even the number of times my heart has beaten. Because it is pretty interesting. But this year, I can't even be bothered. Is knowing all these things going to change a single thing? I don't think so. I don't need my iPhone to be telling me I'm walking a lot because I know.
I used to accelerate as fast as possible. And now, what I mostly seem to be doing is fall back. And that's great because I get to see more. I have more random encounters. And anyway, what's the rush? I still like to walk fast, but I move slowly. I just stopped over at the ruins of the San Pedro church in Vienna. It's a nice quiet garden. Garden. And uh, still thinking about the walking fast, moving slow thing. It seems almost a bit early to get into this particular mindset. But I don't mind at all. I'm pretty sure the initial hardship has driven this point home. The point being to take it easy, very distinctively. In a way, it's Zen in the art of walking. And I'm walking kind of like the unpredictable flight pattern of a butterfly. I'll walk with a group of people I know or randomly bumped into for a bit. And then I fall back again because there's something I need to record. I'm here, I'm there. I'm everywhere and nowhere. I might be in mid-conversation and say, sorry, I gotta go and stop on a tree and listen to the wind go through it. Listen. I used to look at the kilometer counter and proudly watch the numbers add up. And today I have an idea of my geographic whereabouts, but not kilometer count, and I don't care. Even my burning desire to get coffee and croissant in every other village seems to have abated somewhat. I'll get coffee, or I don't. Big deal. Although I suspect this might only be a fluke, a temporary fluke of my system. But for now, I'm really enjoying this new rhythm that the Camino sort of forced upon me. I think I really needed it. And it forced me to open up to let time be. And to be op more open to let things happen, which in theory I am, but in practice, there was obviously something to be desired. So now, I'll just see what happens. And I'm almost in Longronia. 
and then I'll just take it from there. So if you like this kind of thing, subscribe and come walk with me. See you there. I'm sitting under this beautiful big tree with the wind going through it. It's a lot of wind. And leaving Logroño this morning on a beautiful sunny day. And the sun bathed the city in low angle sun rays. And I could start to see the first street signs for Burgas which is about one-third of the way. But it's still quite a way out. It just feels so good to be using my body the way it was intended. I always say my body is... if Dua Lipa, the way Dua Lipa says it. <laughs> I don't know, my body, my body, I don't know. Dua, it's Dua. Anyway, my knee is slowly mending and I vowed to never take this experience for granted because it was quite the shot to the bow. It just feels good to walk. Ironically, the knee starts hurting when I sit down for a while and then start walking again. Maybe that just means I I need to stay in motion. Last night I had a serendipitous encounter with Moon, a Korean PhD, who's walking the Camino between academia and a job he's starting in robotics. And he said he didn't have a bed for the night, so I offered him the spare that I had in my apartment. And it's just one of those encounters that you have on the Camino that are random and great for both, both parties involved. And then we went downtown Logroño and over Pinchos we talked about this and that and we also talked about how we would never have met if it wasn't for the Camino. And we'll just as likely never meet again because he has to walk fast due to time constraints. Capturing selfies provokes a weird self-consciousness within me because the act of photographing oneself and put it on the internet feels kind of peculiar or even vain and that's an aspect I really wish to avoid projecting on the other hand in our era of normalized self-portraiture does anyone even care? am I overthinking this innocuous ritual? because YouTube thumbnails with faces get a lot more views and that's the reality I have to confront. And while viewership isn't my sole motivation, I also don't want my efforts and the many hours of work that go into these movies to languish in obscurity, never to be seen again. So perhaps incorporating my face occasionally could create a deeper connection with viewers. A humanized voice behind the videos. Since you always hear me, but you rarely see me. And anyway, am I not stealing my soul when I take my own picture? How does that work? I deeply appreciate your thoughtful comments. 
reading and responding to them is the least I can do when you take the time to write them. But balancing the editing process with long walking days, it's possible that I occasionally miss a response. Also, YouTube's comment section is in disarray and that doesn't help. It's quite a mess. But anyway, I'm reading them all, so thank you for that. If you like more of this, follow, maybe give me a thumbs up, and come walk along with me on the Camino. Moving slowly also means that I can take the time to read the scribbled wisdom or stupidities on those underpass walls. And there are quite a few nuggets of wisdom in there that are easy to overlook if you just sprint through. Obviously who the real author is is often unknown or irrelevant, but it's good to read them. And occasionally I take a picture of one and maybe I'll do a thing about it in an episode sooner or later. I've also not listened to music yet while I walk because the sounds were so spectacular to begin with that I saw no need to listen to music and to take myself out of the oral experience. The moment will come when I want to listen to music and it's coming closer, but for now, I enjoy just listening. I listen to the wind here going through something and acting like a flute. It's a very windy day and I love the sounds it makes. It's another beautiful sunny morning leaving Najera. The town is not my favorite stop on the Camino, but even the experiences you're not so fond of in the moment will sometime be an interesting memory. Like the moldy bathroom in our hostel yesterday. And my knee is gradually recovering and a strange thing is that I'm still on my first box of cookies. I don't know what's wrong with me. I usually devour them by the truckload. And I want to talk about something just as mundane today, but even something so mundane can hold some significance in my eyes. The backpack. As I hoist the familiar weight onto my back, I almost feel a sense of reassurance wash over me. This backpack is more than just a container for my belongings. It's almost my armor against the challenges that lie ahead. Without it, I would feel naked and vulnerable to the elements and the rigors of the journey. The backpack becomes almost an extension of my body propelling me forward like the sail of a windsurfer, harnessing the wind's force. 
it's a counterweight, a driving force that keeps me moving. One footfall after another towards my ultimate destination, Santiago de Compostela or Finisterre. The backpack has become an intrinsic part of my journey, holding everything I own. To truly engage in the pilgrimage, you must carry your own backpack. Editing your belongings down to the bare essentials isn't just a practical step you need to do, but a crucial part of the core of pilgrimage. Having your things shipped from one town to the next in a prearranged way misses the point entirely. While it may allow you to claim you walk the Camino de Santiago, deep down you know you kind of didn't. It goes with that saying that if you're injured, exhausted, or physically unable to carry your backpack, by all means have it shipped. But if you're capable to carry it, carry it. That weight on your back levels the playing field among pilgrims. Those walking without this weight gives them an unfair advantage in reaching the albergues faster and with less fatigue. Disrupting the delicate balance of equality of the journey. This is kind of unfair. What you want to do is be on equal footing with the other pilgrims. And seeing many pilgrims carrying only the small day packs leaves a bad taste in my mouth. If you're physically able, carrying your backpack is a mark of respect for the pilgrimage and those who walked it centuries ago. It's a way to honor the hardships and the spirit of the Camino. We have it so easy today with our lightweight gear, our waterproof jackets, shoes that feel like walking on clouds. Can you imagine the hardships of pilgrims 500 years ago? You need to do the work. There are no shortcuts. You need to pull your weight, and the weight will pull you. The Camino is a great equalizer, and altering the rules for personal convenience undermines its very idea. Because your backpack is not just a burden, but a companion, enabling this journey. Honoring it means carrying it as intended on your back. Just as a warrior wouldn't enter battle without armor, your backpack is your shield on this pilgrimage. A 
As the Latin saying goes, omnia mea mecum porto. All that is mine, I carry with me. As you walk the Camino, you come to realize that the true weight you bear is not the one on your back, but the one within you. The physical possessions pale in comparison to your character, your wisdom, and your heart. In the end, it is these intangible things that you will carry with you long after the last step is taken, the backpack set aside, and the journey complete. They are the things that have been shaped by the journey itself, forged through the challenges and revelations encountered along the way. Just as the ancient Roman philosophers understood, the true wealth we possess lies not in material goods, but in the essence of who we are. It's a truth that rings as clear today as it did millennia ago. Because the real pilgrimage is not the one walked on the outside, but the one you walked within. I want to share some thoughts that came up as I walked through the peculiar village of Sirenia that you see here. Many of the towns and cities and villages along the Camino are old, steeped in history, some are dilapidated and almost devoid of people. But their crumbling facades hold a certain beauty or authenticity. And that's why Siruanya strikes such a discordant note. It's an artificially constructed resort village with pristine golf courses and villas. To me, the antithesis of reality. It's like a manufactured oasis designed to insulate guests from the harsh realities of the world. Too neat, too manicured, too sterile. It's a facade, a hollow shell, devoid of any soul. Sirenia exudes an eerie sterility, like a Jacques Tati movie, stripped of its irony. This village to me is the epitome of artifice. But maybe that's what its part-time inhabitants seek. To my eyes, it seems sad, sterile, as if rendered in a 3D program. I'm thinking about doing a special episode on it, a short one, just because I got a lot of interesting images from it. Anyway, have a look at yourself.
to arrive in Santo Domingo de la Calzada during a vibrant fiesta with the locals dressed in their Sunday best and letting loose after morning at church. The atmosphere is electric and the ambient volume is reaching new heights as everyone talks at once. It's as if the entire town has taken to the streets and one glorious uninhibited celebration of life itself. It's a quintessential Spanish experience and one that I, for one, adore. I bathe in the crowd, the odd pilgrim sticking out like a sore thumb among the locals. Trying to get an order in at the counter is a battle that I'm losing frequently. But the wait was definitely worth it. The pinchos are delicious. After a great post walk in Santo Domingo de la Calzada yesterday, the Camino today led us through a colossal highway construction site. A stark contrast between ancient pilgrimage and modern progress. There were towering machines that dwarfed us pilgrims, and we must have appeared like ants.
and we must have appeared like ants crawling across the industrial landscape. It's an odd sight to witness gigantic Komatsu trucks rumbling past groups of travelers on a centuries-old spiritual journey. And to the untrained eye, the workers seem to simply operate massive equipment, transporting vast quantities of materials back and forth across the site. The jarring juxtaposition was unmistakable. Us trekkers walking a centuries-old pilgrimage committed to an ancient rite of spiritual renewal. Suddenly confronted by the insatiable progress of modern development. But there was also an intriguing raw beauty to the choreography of this Herculean endeavor before us. And the comedic element of us walking straight through it. After the construction zone, the trail went along a busy road. And we found ourselves surrounded by a non-stop stream of thundering trucks barreling past us with a singular purpose, which is to reach their destinations as fast as possible. And these behemoth trucks made their intentions very clear. When you see them from afar, their colorful forms cutting across the landscape are almost picturesque. But walking right beside them, you can't escape the gnarly cacophony that's grinding us down and urging us onward. The constant noise really got to me and I was quite happy as I reached Belorado. And today's journey didn't lead through quaint villages or scenic nature, but rather across rolling hills of cultivated farmland. It's green but barren. Devoid of singing birds and the vibrant life of true wilderness. Maybe an apt metaphor for the juxtaposition of past and present that we navigated. The ancient and the modern, not separated by time, but in a way intertwined in the paradoxical dance. And yet, as technology reaches even the most remote corners, remaking the world in its image, these old paths still endure in their own little pockets. Yet there was a strange beauty in the contrast itself the urge to journey, to seek enlightenment, is as old as civilization itself. But the methods and the means have evolved. Just as humanity's quest for progress and mastery over the earth have. The highway may one day be completed a new artery in the region's logistic system. But the Camino will remain serpentine, timeless. 
defying the forward march of progress through its ancient simplicity. And we pilgrims will continue our atavistic right and just keep on walking. This is where I'm recording my audio on this little thing. Look, it's Bellarado from above, near the old castle. And it looks like it's going to rain. So the Camino. Hey. The first rainy day since crossing the Pyrenees. That's really good. I got up early to try to get a leg up against the rain. But of course, the rain had other plans. The path was sometimes a real mud fest. Ponchos and the rain covers of every bright color under the sun no. light up the path like beacons. Their wearers grimly determined to reach drier ground. The rain brings out the colors in plants and hikers alike. But there's a strange comfort in embracing the discomfort. Quebec in Spain. So you get wet, big deal. As long as it's sort of drizzling or drizzling plus. And as long as your shoes don't get drenched. It really isn't that big a deal. muddy and quite a climb. It's a combination for water, sweat and impaired vision.
My knee is slowly becoming less of a concern and now feels stronger every day. Proof of the healing power of taking it easy and of perseverance. But like a protective mother, I remain vigilant, mindful that a single misstep could still derail this adventure. I'm still trying to get to the bottom of why I'm spurning so many opportunities of drinking coffee or eating cookies. But maybe, just maybe, I will have the answer by the time I get to Santiago. Or perhaps this was the question all along. I'm starting to realize I'm not even thinking all that much. With each kilometer, I surrender more of myself to the journey and I feel my brain slowly coming to a condition of relative idleness. My thoughts, usually a nervous monkey of activity, now drift lazily like summer clouds. The simple act of watching my step, of negotiating the slippery mud for hours on end, becomes a kind of meditation in itself. Occupying just enough mental space to keep me busy without overwhelming my senses. No longer a nervous monkey leaping from thought to thought, just being. It's almost off-putting. Should my brain not be overthinking things and jumping from one thought to the next before finishing another? After all, that's what I've conditioned it to do. And I'm not even in the meseta yet. And then I was suddenly all by myself in the forest, in the lull between rain showers, and just walked. And didn't think of anything at all, except listen to the sounds. I was holding my recorder, and I was into the sounds of the forest. If you want to see what an empty head looks like, take a look on your screen. It's an empty head. I'm just walking, not thinking about anything much at all, except maybe not falling into this puddle. All right. Anyway, it's nice. By the way, my small audio recorder is my joyful addition to my otherwise unchanged Camino equipment this year. It's like having another set of eyes, except they're a pair of ears. Tomorrow I'll post a video with a half hour forest walk that's really a soundscape walk. I've made it through the cold and wet day surprisingly well, but it's the evening cold that truly got to me. I'm freezing and I'm thinking, why am I doing this? And why am I doing it in May, knowing how bad the weather can be? The cold is the one thing that knocks out both my body and my soul, especially over longer stretches. And even more so when I know it should be warm. And the forecast is grim. Day 12 of my Camino de Santiago. I'm walking up the mountain that leads to Burgos. 
It's freezing cold. Two or three degrees. Windy. I'm tired. The bed wasn't the most comfortable. And I'm just kind of a little exhausted. And the hand holding my stick has to keep taking turns with the other hand because it just gets too cold. All I can tell you, the Camino is not a holiday. I listen to the birds. My body doesn't really feel 100%. I don't think I'm sick, but I'm just not, it's not fully there. I've now reached the top of the mountain. There's an icy cold wind blowing in my face. I don't know if you can hear it. I can hear a factory in the distance. And I can't even see Burgos. So getting closer. That cold wind is really relentlessly trying to go through to my bones pretty successfully. I don't really have enough layers to wear because you always think May in Spain should be warm, but I'm always wrong. It's not. And my body and the cold, they don't go way too well together. It just kind of stops to function. <laughs> I need the heat. I'm trying to walk fast, but it's just so cold. I have a nice hotel room to look forward to because I thought I'd treat myself for the stay in Burgos, which is great. But on the other hand, the weather forecast looks kind of grim. And once again, the task of a very physical purpose to not freeze to death and to get there will take care of many of the silly thoughts that you often have. You just don't have the means to think about much else than how do I get there? How do I stay warm? And also, when can I finally have my breakfast and coffee? Oh, I need it.
It's almost quiet. Oh no. There are two ways to go into Burgos. The traditional route leads you through an uninviting expanse of <coughs> industrial sprawl, devoid of much aesthetic charm. And this semi-hidden alternative takes you along the river, and it's far more scenic and serene almost. That's the one I took last year. And it was and it was very much worth it. But today with the chill in the air and the, the weather challenges ahead. I feel drawn to the rugged authenticity or even ugliness of the industrial route. Kind of as a symbolic metal to the grit required of every pilgrim eventually. So I'm going full industrial today. This road is taking me past by the tire factory, old car shops, truck repair centers, logistics centers. A Pepsi factory. Some old club named Victoria. Lots of cars scattered about. Trucks everywhere. Hotel Las Vegas. Who would know? Hotel Las Vegas in Burgos. I'm taking a picture of it right now. We humans are peculiar creatures. Many of us crave meat, but we don't want to witness the unglamorous process that brings it to our tables. And similarly, we, we want the conveniences of modern life. But we prefer to look away from the gritty realities of their production and from the intrusion of industry upon our landscapes. Ideally, we would just prefer to to have these unsightly necessities remain invisible. To remain untainted by the harsh realities that enable 
more comfortable existence. And if we could, we would do away with the trucks to have the highway for ourselves. But you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. Certain unpleasant tasks and processes are inevitable because they're the foundations upon which our society is built. That's the harsh truth we have to face. And walking the Pesral Camino and the Industrial Camino is a pretty direct reminder that beauty and hardship often coexist and are so close together. Everything is intertwined and nothing is anything without the other. So don't be deceived by the pastoral veneer of the Camino. Camino even sounds cute. It often is cute. But often, it is not. The Camino is no holiday. It has its own ironclad ferocity that tries to test you whenever it can and then just as you're about to give up it brings you a ray of sunshine it's something really nice some serendipitous encounter and you are reconciled with the hardships of the Camino I gotta say, I'm glad I took the industrial road into Burgos. I'm still on it, but it's just very interesting. to see a lot that I wouldn't have seen had I taken the picturesque semi-secret path into town. I got to take a lot of pictures that I wouldn't have otherwise, which to me is always very pleasing. The sun came out every now and then, so I'm not freezing so much anymore. And all this to show you that the Camino is just one great paradox. One way or another, the Camino forces you into the moment. And if that moment is in a muddy path in the forest or in an industrial sprawl zone outside of the historic city of Burgos. It's the moment. It doesn't really matter. But you are here and you are here now. And I will soon be in Burgos. I 
I'm now closer to the center of Burgers and I can't help but notice how the grimness of this morning has turned into something quite interesting. Really not what I expected, but in the end it was quite a good walk and uh, I'm not quite so desperate anymore in terms of the weather forecast. Maybe it's not going to be quite that bad. And if it is, I'll just have a nice hotel room to snuggle in. So anyway, yeah. That was that. Hello, burgers. Here I come. I'm here in burgers, taking a breather from my Camino, and I'm pondering a question that has long lingered in my mind. I gotta look at my notes here. Why do I feel this intense need to capture every fleeting moment or to document almost each step of my journey? It's because this drive that is sometimes misunderstood as bordering on madness is the very essence of who I am. It flows through me like a river, fueling my creativity. It's an energy that needs an outlet. And to deny this compulsion would be to deny the creative spirit that's animating my being. And creating daily video diaries while walking the Camino isn't really a choice for me. My impulse to document, record, observe, interpret, and display the world around me comes from a deep place within me. The themes I cover emerge organically. They almost present themselves to me, creating a narrative that reflects the landscape of my thoughts and emotions. Making these videos is like a hunger I need to satiate, a way to express myself in ways that words or photos alone cannot. So each day, I pour my heart and soul into these diaries, also hoping to connect with others and try to shed a little light on the human experience. Some may wonder why I choose to document my journey instead of simply living it. But the truth is, creating is my way of making sense of the world. It's how I process and understand my place in the grand scheme of things. And to deny this urge would be to deny a fundamental part of who I am. And why deny myself pleasure? Besides, show me a good artist who isn't obsessed by creating their work. The Camino is a journey that by definition embraces a philosophy of simplicity and minimalism. This also means the challenge of creating meaningful and presentable work with an absolute minimum of tools. It's not the tools. It's the craftsman using them. And so 
this is also a challenge, but not by any means the prime motivation. Part of my process has always been to get the most out of very few tools. My Camino friend Nikolai shared a great Charles Bukowski quote with me. When asked, what makes a man a writer? Bukowski replied, well, it's simple. You either get it down on paper or jump off a bridge. This simple but profound statement encapsulates the soul of creation for me. It's not a matter of choice. It's a necessity and a vital part of my being. Art has in all its forms the power to bring people together, which is one reason why I'm sharing my journey. Because inside a subjective truth, universal truths can sometimes be found. The fact that almost nobody sees these videos, notwithstanding. My audience is tiny, but loyal, and to me that seems fair enough. In creativity, there's no room for half-hearted efforts. And to quote Bukowski once more, who said, if you're going to try, go all the way. Otherwise, don't even start. It requires a full commitment, a willingness to dive headfirst, deep into the unknown, to see what happens. And so each video diary is a witness to this journey. A blend of the pain and the joy and all the things that define my Camino experience. So, why do I choose to document my Camino through daily videos? Because it's more than a record. It's a reflection of myself and of the experience and introspection of walking the Camino that I invite you to join me on. So there you have it. This is why I make daily videos of my Camino de Santiago. So if you like this kind of thing, subscribe, leave a like if you want, and come walk along with me on the Camino de Santiago. I can only do a short narration today because it's very late and I really got to get some sleep. I left Borges a little later because the weather forecast said it was going to be very cold and so I braced for the worst. I wore every layer that I had and my backpack was light because I was wearing everything. I had a big breakfast and then left the city and was surprised to see how empty everything was. There were no pilgrims to be seen. It was completely empty almost. And then I tried to sit out a big rain shower in a cafe at the end of town that is just off the path. So there are almost no pilgrims going there. It was a really nice experience. And then I got really rained on anyway. You'll see, it was quite the rain shower. Everything got soaked. But then the sun came back out and it was one of those sort of mystical Meseta experiences. Because from, from rain to sunshine, what a range. Uh, but I will now let the pictures do the talking and the sounds do the singing and just enjoy and have a look.
Trying to record the wind and the rain. Not sure it's possible. It's raining quite hard now.
to climb. I'm climbing up the mountain that sort of marks the true beginning of the Meseta because once you're up there it's where the flatlands really begin and the Meseta is on for real. The climb is quite steep I think it's about 400 meters difference in height. Looking at the ominous clouds, it might also be raining by the time I get there. Built in shower. This is the Meseta, the land of wide plains, big skies, huge clouds, and the open road. 
The Masira is feared by many and loved by some. And I count myself in the latter camp. I think it's amazing to walk through these wide open spaces with basically nothing. I mean, there's a lot, but there's nothing. Also reminds me of Terence Malick's movie, Badlands. So for me, this is the Badlands of the Camino. Even though there's nothing bad about it, obviously. Also, there's no one around. It's very empty. It's beautiful. It goes on more or less like this for a couple of days. And there are people who decide to skip it and take the bus. But I think they're missing out because this is as ambient an experience as they come. Well, that solitude I was craving for a few days ago, here it is. There's just literally no one, no locals either. Where is everyone? It's now windy. And it's a very long but very beautiful day across the Meseta. There's so much wide open space and so few people that you start to feel like a stick figure walking along the horizon or something. And you're not just alone. You almost start feeling lonely. But in a good way. To just have no social stimulants around you. It's interesting. So you have frequent social interactions and often very intense bursts when you're at dinner with people or you share a room with a couple of people or something like that. So that's always good. And it's short bursts. Which is great, I mean, it's very different than what I had before. and everything is interesting. As much as I've walked today and 
with the wide open spaces. Walking itself becomes a sort of hypnotic ambient hum or I need a better way to describe it but you're just it's like almost walking on a magic carpet or something you don't even have to do anything You're totally on autopilot. Just walk. And see where it takes you. I'm now in Fromista and after that major bit of solitude I ran into a rather a large group of Germans, the travel group, ran into me just as I was about to start a dialogue with a goat. And first I was like, oh no, because they were walking, obviously, part of the, the Camino. And um, they were going to go at my rhythm. <laughs> and it was just this big, it was an entire bus of people just walking a short leg. So I was a little... I was a little annoyed, let's say, because, you know, I had all the space to myself earlier. And now there's all this group of people. And of course, they're not doing the Camino, they're just doing a short walk on it. And I was a bit conceited. Anyway, as I was passing them, I chatted one or two of them up and then some others chatted me up in return. And we actually had some pleasant and interesting exchanges and there are a group of people who want to explore the country and the landscape and hike a bit here and there and that's a great thing they were all they were all very curious about what it's like to, to really walk the Camino the whole thing and um, they were curious curiosity is good so that was a very pleasant surprise that I hadn't expected. I'm known for Mr. Such an odd place. But it's very interesting. I'm looking for something to eat. I'm feeling a bit dizzy or lightheaded today. But that's okay since it's a relatively short and uneventful walk along the road to Carrion de los Candes. And I've decided to take out some of the velocity. The long trek across those vast plains of the Meseta yesterday all by myself was an intense and beautiful experience. It's a rare circumstance to be entirely alone. And it's kind of fascinating to observe how it affects you.
And I suspect that part of my exhaustion today comes from being mentally, physically and emotionally drained from yesterday's walk. It took a lot out of me. And yet, at the same time, gave me back so much more. By the way, I'm noticing how I'm beginning to confuse the days in my video diary entries. Which makes me wonder if the days are even relevant anymore. Time and distance are blurring together. And I might just stop mentioning them going forward. I'll see. Listening to the night before's very short introduction to the video, which I recorded after that day in the Meseta, I could barely form a coherent sentence, which is proof of how extremely drained I was. But the reason I want to continue making daily videos is that there's a lot to be said about the immediacy of experience. When it's unvarnished by hindsight and without overthinking anything. Just putting it out directly has a quality all its own. The videos are put together once I'm back home. Will by definition have a different angle than craft and production quality. They will be more meticulous with the luxury of a powerful computer and time. But I believe that trying to capture the immediate impact is only possible during the journey itself. And this is why I think these direct voiceovers have a bit of a unique quality or, or an added layer of their own. It's almost like they're their own movie. You might not lose out on much by listening with eyes closed. Beyond the spoken words, the tone of my voice and the ambient sounds while recording tell another layer of the story that I think cannot be conveyed otherwise. And this is why I need to keep doing this, even if I detach the narrative from the actual days. Because time and distances have become indistinguishable to a degree anyway. That day in the Meseta was also the right moment to dive into the music and get lost in it. 
I had not touched my music since I started the Camino. But the desire to listen has been building up. And now I'm ready to harvest and listen to these tracks while walking on forever and ever. And it was intensely beautiful. While I was listening, the dark clouds seemed to be dancing around me. But I never got more than even a drop or two of rain. Songs by Warpaint and others. I'll try to link them below if I think about it. Do not forget. Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to relate to uh, the tales to my loved ones back home or... It's impossible, I think. I mean, I try with videos. So if you like this kind of thing, subscribe. Leave a like if you feel like it. Do it for the algorithm. And come walk along with me on the Camino. I'm at the tail end of a pretty uneventful walk along mostly straight sand roads along the Meseta. I don't want to say boring, but you know, not too much to excite the eye or anything else, which is really fine because also. My body seems a bit weak. I don't know if I had wrong water or ate something that wasn't so good. But uh, I'm definitely fighting these last two hours. It's not a breeze. 
and I hope let some rest or actually take care of things. But first of all, I need to get a bed at the albergue, which doesn't take reservations. So there's that little risk. I really hope I don't have to go one further because I'm not sure my energy level would be sufficient to actually make it there. I didn't walk solo for once. Today I walked for long stretches in the company of Judith from the Netherlands. It was very relaxed, we had a good chat. Walked at a good speed, like brisk, but not too fast. And yeah, that's interesting too. The city of Leon isn't that far away now. It's another two nights and I should be there. In the condition I'm in, I'll be very happy to kick back and relax for a few days. That will do me some good. Your body dictates so much of your experience, obviously. When you feel like this, you kind of just want to get there in one piece. And even the pictures I took and the videos, frankly, I think it all looks pretty average. Nothing too special or exciting. The starlings in the morning with their spectacle, that was probably the visual highlight of the day. Not every day can be extra special. Some days are just kind of average or below average. That's okay. But so the other days can be great. Unfortunately, the two albergues in Terra Dios that I hoped would have a vacancy didn't. So that means I have to keep on walking. There's another village in three kilometers or so. And then another. I'm hoping I find something because I really need some rest. And uh, I hope I don't have to do something like 80 kilometers to Leon or something, which of course I won't, but I want to slow down and take out velocity, but the Camino won't let me for whatever reason. So I keep, keep on walking. The upshot is that'll make the stretches to Leon a little shorter tomorrow and after tomorrow so I just have to grin and bear it for now as exhausted as I am it's also interesting to be walking all by myself 
in the afternoon because everyone's happily laying on their albergue beds and I am very much not. I hope I find something soon because I'm, I'm ready to just lay down. I'm very happy my knee is doing okay because it wasn't after the long Meseta day the other day. It was starting to hurt again. So I'm extra careful to not overstretch it, but on the other hand, there's nothing I can do about the distance I need to cover. I just looked behind me and I saw two people moving fast with sticks and everything. And now it's an actual race to the next bed, but I'm already running on empty, so I don't see myself ready to take on the race at all. So I hope they're tired too, but they don't look it. I'm completely exhausted and uh, I don't know where and how I found somewhere to sleep but I needed to take a break. <sighs> Maybe some chocolate will help. face of grinning and bearing it. I'm on Moratinas and 
I see people leaving the first alberga in town, which probably means it's full, but I will ask anyway. Hola, buenas tardes. ¿Tienes sacado la habitación de su cama? Sí, 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 sí. Sí, camas, solo camas. Sí, solo camas. Okay. Um, we have or a bed in dormitory, mm -hmm. or the last room available is a triple room for three people. Yes. Yeah, by myself. So I'll take the so bed. It's actually. Uh, not the, the price of a triple, but 60 euros. Yeah, um, I think the dormitory. Better. Yeah, 12, right? 12, yes. Yeah. Okay. Is that is it uh, bunk beds or? What? Oh, perfect. So it's 14 for the dinner. I could throw up and faint at the same time and just general unease with my body, very strange. I don't like it very much at all. And uh, I can't even look at my pictures, which is never a good sign. I look at them and they feel, make me feel nauseous. Uh, anyway, oh. all right, I'm gonna try to get some more sleep. I took a nap, see where this goes. Last night, my digestive system erupted with a grand fanfare. Fortunately, while everyone else was out at dinner. Unfortunately, the fireworks continued throughout the night, which made for a pretty grim and sleepless ordeal. And to make matters worse, the bathroom was in the sleeping area. And the next day was a first for me on the Camino, taking a taxi to reach my destination. But walking was out of the question. I could barely find the strength to leave the albergue. And anyway, they tend to kick you out early. The last thing you want when battling an illness is to be stuck in an albergue. Let me tell you. And so a taxi it was, since the only train to Leon had already left an hour earlier. My friend Jim, who had planned to join the Camino in Leon, graciously gifted me his apartment reservation. After pressing matters, forced him to fly back home, unfortunately. But the prospect of a private, quiet sanctuary was such a welcome relief in my weakened state. And unlike my experience during the knee injury, where to watch the pilgrims walk along the path, I should have been walking, but I was watching them from a bus. It didn't pain me this time. Exhaustion had drained me to the point where I could barely stand. And I was just grateful to sit in the car, being driven to a bed. So in the end, the meseta has gotten the better of me. As feared by many and loved by some for good reasons, it had won this round. I was disappointed not to walk those final steps to Leon, but there was just no question of continuing. I didn't want to put my entire health at risk. 
It felt strange to cover in an hour what would have taken two days of walking. And yet that very hour provided a perspective on the pilgrim's journey, a semi-poetic reminder of the distance we traverse every day. My first two Caminos, although challenging, seemed like a breeze compared to this one. I'd even done a cocky 100 kilometer overnight walk. But this time, my body keeps firmly saying, wait a minute. There's surely a message in there somewhere. It's a reminder that the Camino is a journey of growth and self-discovery and not a test of endurance. So let me see what I find out in the end. So I arrived in Leon, where I am right now, greeted by a beautiful apartment. The perfect safe space to recover. So thanks, Jim. I didn't leave the bed all day and slept all night. And while feeling better today, my energy level remains below zero. I feel completely drained. It's hard to pinpoint what caused it, but I suspect it was some rural tap water that my body violently, violently did not agree with. I think I will focus on bottled water from now on. And then this afternoon, the sun decided to come out and send a few rays my way, which has its own magic qualities. So I go out every now and then, drinking tea, eating bananas, and honestly, looking forward to hitting the bed again soon. So here's hoping a few days of rest will restore me to walking order. So as always, if you like this kind of thing, hit that like button if you feel like it, subscribe, and come walk along with me on the Camino de Santiago. Today was a very different day. The rhythm of the Camino is a cadence that gets etched into your bones. The constant crunching of shoes on the earth. The sway of your backpack and the ebb and flow of effort and rest. But this forward momentum has come to a screeching halt for me. Normally, I would be devouring kilometers, racking up notches of villages traversed. I'm now almost pleasantly immobile. No need to fight the inertia. I could only lose against a foe, like an illness. And Leon happens to be one of my favorite stopovers on the Camino. So why not enjoy the extended break and make the most of it? If I'm being honest with myself, I won't be ready to walk tomorrow. I could conceivably try, but the body kind of says no. So when the sun came out this afternoon, 
I decided to explore the city a little and take some photos. But I quickly realized my energy wouldn't take me very far. So I just sat on a bench before the magnificent cathedral, just letting its bright splendor wash over me. And I just sat there immobilized but content, the sun warming me up finally. And as I did so, I became an observer of the theater of life playing out before me. Tourists clustered around the cathedral, their phones clicking away in a futile attempt to capture the immensity of such grandeur. School groups meandered by. Their laughter and their chatter, beautifully oblivious to the solemnity of the ancient stones they're supposed to admire. Pilgrims, too, made this monumental beacon a natural meeting point in the heart of the city. Their slightly weathered faces spoke of the long road they had traveled until here and made me feel a little apart. Although, of course, the familiar faces greeted me. Asian travel groups with the obligatory guide and the phones stretched high to take a picture of the thing that you're supposed to take a picture of. Selfie sticks waved like periscopes on a submarine. Their owners trying to insert themselves into the frame to become part of the picture evidence that they were here. Although, were they really? Followed by the taking of turns, making victorious poses for the people back home, if no one else. And then there were the locals, those for whom Leon is not a destination, but a home. They just went about their routines, oblivious to the ebb and flow of travelers. An elderly woman with a small dog in town, more vivacious than anyone else in sight, engaged in a lively conversation I had no business in understanding. It's amazing what you're able to see when you just sit somewhere to bear witness to this cross-section of humanity simply by sitting still. Just life happening in all its banality and beauty. Once again, I was forced to sit still to radically change my pace and to not do, but be. The fact that this is the second time on this Camino that this happens isn't lost on me. Maybe it's the trail working its subtle alchemy. Stillness allows us to see. 
since we are freed from the demands of perpetual motion. Walking the Camino is slow, but it is nevertheless constant motion. We often become so focused on the physical act of walking that we can miss some of the deeper lessons this path has to offer. Stillness is presence. And once more, the Camino has forced me or nudged me into the present moment. So if you like this kind of thing, leave a like, write a comment, subscribe, and come walk along with me on the Camino de Santiago. My journey hit another roadblock overnight as my gut health took an unwelcome turn. Instead of sleeping on a comfortable mattress, I was forced into a far less desirable situation. It was a night of discomfort and frustration. And the setback felt like a cruel twist after the slow progress I had been making. The moral and practical support of friends was a lifeline that kept me afloat. And also the sun is out, which always manages to breathe life into me. And I found a good place to stay for one more night. As I sat in a cafe, with all the temperament of a sack of potatoes, filling my body with electrolytes, a thing happened. A kind woman from Denmark approached me and she told me how my videos had inspired her to go on this very pilgrimage. It was a small testimonial of the ripples our actions can create. And I love it when people go out of their way to go and say it. Leon is brimming with spring energy, very much like I'm not. I feel like a zombie, forced to be a spectator amidst all this free flow of energy. So many cute little places offering pinchos and so many other things that I can only admire from afar. All this life happening around me and I can't participate. And it's been days. It's extremely frustrating. Leon is a great city to spend a few days in, but it's a shame if you can't do any of the things that make the city interesting. I'm not sure yet I can walk tomorrow. Actually, I probably won't. I'm just so exhausted. But I'll see how tomorrow feels. But even just walking through this lively city seemed to have given back some energy, which is great to see everyone out and about and enjoying life. And I also think I need to slow down a couple of things, one of which is the pace of these diaries. I think I'm putting myself under too much pressure by doing them daily. There is a lot to process. And that's why I'm doing it, but maybe some of it can wait. I don't have to do this daily. It's 
just too much stress. A couple other things too. And I think my double bodily warning shot and the stress, they're all kind of related. So I'm gonna dig into that a little bit. It felt both daunting and ambitious this morning, but also optimistic and purposeful to hoist my backpack again. But this is what I'm here for. I noticed I had to pull it quite a bit tighter. I must have lost some weight. I feel a certain wobbliness in my legs. And also mentally, I feel like I'm setting out to sea by myself, which I essentially am. Nobody leaves at noon, but I wanted to enjoy my first breakfast in a long time and also suss out what my body feels like. I don't know yet how far I will be able to walk, but I'm about to find out. And I don't have a destination. And like the usual giant wave of people that almost carries you, there's not a single pilgrim to share the path with me. I'm almost starting to miss the click-clack of the metallic poles, but only almost. I could easily use another day to relax and recover, but I also don't want to be stuck in some permanent limbo of disease and recovery. Action produces information. And so, although it might be a bit risky to hit the road again, I felt like I should at least try. It's hard, but no one said it was going to be easy. This Camino is both mentally and physically quite a different beast. Much more demanding than my first two. It's almost like the first two Caminos were a dress rehearsal to see if I could do the real thing. The last few days were only a silly virus infection. But I really feel like it has taken undue amounts of energy out of me, both physically and emotionally. I feel drained and depleted from the inside. I saw a recent picture of me and it seemed like I had gotten a lot more gray hair. I feel like I really need to do something for my soul. My first two Caminos felt like an exciting adventure, a joyful expedition with friends where deep connections were formed amidst the inevitable occasional hardships. But this time around, there are moments when the path seems to mirror Colonel Willard's descent into the heart of darkness in the movie Apocalypse Now. That haunting odyssey inspired by literary greats like Joseph Conrad's novel and Homer's Odyssey.
Now, I'm not saying my humble Camino is on par with those masterpiece tales. That would be preposterous. But the reason those stories have endured is precisely because they speak to universal truths and experiences we all deal with as human beings on this journey called life. Apocalypse Now can be seen as Willard's plunge into the depth of his own psyche. A confrontation with his inner demons and shadows he had carefully tucked away. His transformative trip up the river, but into himself, forces him to navigate the intricate complexities of human nature and morality itself. The lightness and darkness that coexist within us all. And as I walk this Camino, I can't help but see reflections of that same inward journey playing out. But the Camino isn't just a descent into our own heart of darkness. It's also a walk towards the light. It illuminates a deeper understanding of who we truly are and what our place is in this grand theater of existence. And each twisted knee or aching stomach or whatever else is in your way reminds you that growth requires pushing through discomfort and to embrace the challenges that ultimately crack us open to new perspective and maybe wisdom. So fellow pilgrims, when it's hard, try to lean into the depths this path may take you on. Confront the shadows, but just don't get lost in the darkness. I'm happy with my decision to have left the city in spite of my doubts. It was a beautiful, very solitary walk and I found a great albergue in the middle of nowhere on the alternative route. But we're on that tomorrow. So if you like this kind of thing, leave a like, leave a comment subscribe and come walk along with me on the Camino de Santiago.
it's 8.30 and I'm walking in a glorious sunrise and it feels great to have my body back not speeding through the little villages has some great advantages that little albergue with 10 beds plus one sofa which I got to use was such a special experience it's a village that I used to pass through at high speed without even giving it a glance the hosts were amazing I met some great people there was a concert dogs cats and lots of laughs when I mentioned yesterday that I felt depleted from the inside and that I needed to do something for my soul this was exactly it hitting the road again And then choosing the longer alternate path was my greatest decision. When I left Leon yesterday, a doctor might have advised to chill for another day or two. But that's why I didn't ask a doctor. The simple fact of walking, of using my body, of focusing it on something else, rearranges things to be back in running order. I can't even describe how different my body and my soul feel from just 48 hours ago. I probably activated some self-healing magic by simply walking one step in front of the other. It's an auto-fix for probably most things. I feel like Phoenix risen from the ashes. I really do. And I've completely lost my sense of distances. I just passed the 300 kilometer remaining marker and I was a little surprised. What, only that far left? Not more than that? If you don't keep track of the kilometers, distance just becomes distance. I've noticed I keep my eyes fixed on the ground right in front of me or on the horizon just ahead. 
Why don't I set my default to the sky? And today I made a conscious effort to look more upwards at this boundless sky that was above me. It was a simple but consequential shift in perspective. As people, we are but tiny specks beneath the endless expanse of the sky. And maybe it's our connection to something greater than ourselves. The title of today's episode is inspired by a verse from the song Caution to the Wind by Everything But the Girl. I put a link to it below. It was just playing as I was moving under those incredibly white skies today. The full verse reads, The sky is a cathedral, and I'm home. You don't have to know where you are. For as long as you're under your cathedral, the sky, you are home. So if you like this kind of thing, subscribe, like if you want. Leave a comment and come walk with me on the Camino de Santiago. After yesterday's deeply psychedelic or spiritual experience under the endless skies, 
on those endless roads. Simply enjoying the ability to be walking again. To feel the power of being able to tackle the remaining distances. And then some. And to be able to feed my body what it needs in order to do so. Simple pleasures, but great pleasures. So I just walked and took very few pictures. My most notable ones being of me conversing with the beast. Okay, the horse. Just look at it. I walked the first half with my friend Nikolai and we had a great conversation. I walked the second half by myself and with the music. Brisk walking for the sheer fun of it, but as always, getting there slowly. No plan, only loose aims. I'm walking here and now. I don't budget with or bother with kilometers. They're an afterthought. And so it's always kind of shocking when I see another kilometer marker with yet another big chunk shaved off its total. I know they start dropping fast now. Like a sand clock that suddenly runs empty fast. Slowly, then suddenly. Like so many things. I feel disconnected from everything, but from what is immediately surrounding me. And I feel connected to myself and to the ground underneath me and the music and, of course, the sky. In this regaining of a renewed sense of exploration and adventure, the way still ahead, the flowers, the animals, the friends we make, the moon, the stars, the path. It's magical and it feels it. And the great walk that ends at an incredibly beautiful albergue that is in full jam session. What more could you ask for? It beats me. Listen. So as always, if you like this kind of thing, subscribe, like, the best, leave a comment, let me know what you think of my Camino, and come along with me to walk the Camino de Santiago. No posso ficar bem mais de um minuto com você Sinto muito amor, mas não pode...
It's day 25, I think. Another beautiful sunny day. And after three almost magical alberga experiences in a row, that are certainly would not have had if I hadn't been forced to push reset twice. I'm now getting closer to the Iron Cross, the Cruz de Ferro, where it is a ritual for pilgrims to deposit a rock that they have carried with them. And I thought about the fact that this is now the third little rock that I have moved many hundreds of kilometers. Let's, let's say there are three traveling rocks that I've set somewhere for millions of years and that are now sitting somewhere else for millions of years. It isn't in the nature of the rock to go traveling. Most of them usually stay where they are. So I like to see them as three level rocks on an adventure. And I'm wondering if once I have deposited the third rock, if they will recognize each other as siblings. Or whether they just don't care and remain stoic rocks as rocks tend to be. Who knows? human capability to project ideas or meaning onto things is endless. And whether this means anything to you or whether assigning emotions to that little rock works for you or not is entirely up to you. The rock will remain the rock. Or it can be anything you want it to be.
sido y que esto nunca acabará. Rompió la puerta al amor, no la abrí para que entrara, pero no sirve de nada si tú no quieres quedarte y yo no tuve que darte para que tú te quedaras. Pero yo ya no quiero esperar porque el tiempo se nos vuela y un amor así lo siento desde la escuela y mi corazón con el beso que le diste por la noche se consuela. Pero yo ya no quiero esperar porque el tiempo se nos pasa. Tú dame lo que hay que yo me pongo a buscar casa. Tengo ganas de ti y no sabes cuántas. Hagámonos de todo. Menos falta. Picado en el coche y te imagino en la playa, tu mojaita en sol y tren, yo siendo tu toalla, tú con mi camiseta, que te sirve de toalla, que te la pones de noche, te la quito en la mañana, pero yo ya no quiero esperar. Porque el tiempo se nos vuela, un amor así no siento desde la escuela. Ahora somos perdidas, y este señor, para no gobiar con Floresta María, para no feriar la comida todos los días, estaba la fría y a toda vacía, para no comprar la comida. Y quinientas noches, y quinientas noches, y quinientas noches. ¡Qué bonito! ¡Qué bonito! So I just put my tiny rock on top of the other ones and uh, 
kind of the hardest thing is to try to tune out the inane chatter that is, seems to be a requisite. I don't know. It's just... Can't you wait with talking about your really not all that important things for until 10 minutes later or something? Just be a little quiet for once and think, don't talk, or feel, don't talk. I managed to tune them out at some point. And now there's another little rock on top of other rocks. You make of it what you will. I'm going back down that mountain and see where I end up tonight. I have no idea. I'm having another epic day of walking. I don't feel tiredness or exhaustion or any of those things. Like I'm walking on a magic carpet or something. And I feel like I could walk on forever. El camino es un encuentro de nosotros mismos. Yo no soy un católico practicante. Tengo mis creencias. Yo creo, bueno, que hay poderes que hace que seamos buenos. Y pienso que en el camino, cuando nos encontramos y vemos nuestras debilidades, pequeños problemas, somos capaces de superarlo. Y hay una cuestión que para mí es fundamental. No hay diferencia entre los pueblos. Muy people, es importante. Es muy importante. Los pueblos no somos diferentes. Las personas no somos diferentes. Y en el camino aprendemos a amar al francés, al inglés, al alemán, al otro, al de la moto, es decir, a cualquiera. ¿Sabes? Entonces, que nunca entremos en conflicto en la vida y que lo que aprendemos del camino lo subvertamos después en nuestra vida personal. Así que yo lo único que deseo es mucha salud y mucha libertad, ¿ok? Ok. Y comunicación entre los pueblos. Salud, compañeros. Salud, salud peregrinos. Un vaso para... No, 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 yo tengo vaso, pero tiene agua. Y ah. se puede con agua. Pues, buen apetit y yo ya no hablo más. Un, un poquito, Angie. Venga. Y entonces el brindis. Salud. Salud, brothers. Salud, hermanos. Salud, peregrinos. Salud. 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 Salud.
Yo vi a cara con la garrafa que me queda ahí. No, no, no. Sí, no, no, no. 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 que pensar que si no volvió es porque ya te olvidó perfuma esa flor que se marchitó se marchitó Que tal vez me estuviera amando, me miró y se fue sin decir por qué, sin decir por qué, me miró y se fue sin decir por qué, sin decir sí. por qué. Sambita a cantar, no la esperes más. Tienes que pensar que si no volvió es porque ya te olvidó. Perfuma esa flor que se marchitó, se marchitó. Esa flor que se marchitó, se marchitó. ¡Bravo! ¡Bravo!
there are so many nights in a row of amazing experiences in Donativo albergues. The one yesterday in the tiny village of Acibo, somewhere in the mountains around Panferrada, was one such night. The hosts were amazing and such interesting characters. And there was another impromptu concert in the street after the great dinner cooked by the hosts. After the lows I've had, these highs are very high. I keep pinching myself to see if I'm dreaming, but I know this is all real. The walk down the mountain this morning was magically beautiful. And we passed through Ponferrada, which has a beautiful old town with a historic castle and a few other nice areas. But the fact that I've lost two t-shirts in two days means that I was forced to make a detour to a decathlon sports store that was located in a strip mall. And I got to see places very few pilgrims will ever get to see. It's not that they're missing out on much. But it's interesting to find out how large a city, one of these supposedly small towns can be. There's lots of modern urban development around it that we just pass by. We're better for it, but it's interesting nevertheless. So that was a bit of a grind, walking across the heated up pavement. And it continues to be a grind through some small villages of only middling charms which is totally okay, but I don't mind if the place I'm staying in has something going for it. And I hear that despite its name, Cacabellos fits the bill, which means I'm making a run for it, as well as some of my friends. It's a grind along the busy streets, but I've had such a generous share of high highs that some stretches, some stretches are just going to be mid and that's okay. And I have to say I'm really enjoying the free floating non-committal kind of thing. Just taking it day by day is liberating and takes out unnecessary pressure. You're much more likely to come across interesting places and people. And if you like it somewhere, you just ask for a bed and stay. Easy. Now ask me again if I believe this is the case, if I don't find a bed in Cacabellos, because after a 32 kilometer walk in the punishing heat, I wouldn't, at all, wouldn't mind at all being able to stop. But I think once again, I'll find a bed and things will be fine and I can stop for today.
just another crazy beautiful morning with the sun going over the vineyards and us walking right through it or right through them and mornings like these really have a magic to them and as pilgrims, we always get up really early. And some say it's because they want to get there on time to get a bed or to avoid the heat or whatever. But I really think the true reason is so we can experience these mornings. Mornings like these can turn anyone into a morning person. The time between spring and summer, where the early morning is crisp and then it heats up pretty quickly with the promise of a beautiful day. the landscape bathed in this golden light and the birds competing for attention. No, I think they're just singing because they want to. There really could be no better way to start the day than a morning like this. Yesterday was one of those days that start really beautifully in nature and then you go to a city and it kind of turns, not ugly, but just turns into a grind. You're walking along paved roads and it's all heated up. The villages are charmless. And that's one of the few times when I actually do look at the kilometers and the countdown to when I'll finally get there. It's not always that you're just enthralled by the beauty of it all. And uh, I probably didn't drink enough either and I was just exhausted and drained once I got there after 32 kilometers or something. And then we couldn't find anything real to eat, which is kind of weird in Spain in these small towns. That there's some convenience food that's heated up at best, but no real cooking. It's really hard to find something decent sometimes. So you're exhausted and drained and hungry and can't get anything real to eat. And the place you're staying at just isn't that great. And you're kind of like, all right, okay. And uh, you have a real night's sleep and you wake up and it's a new day and you start again and it's a fresh morning and it's beautiful and you're re-energized and uh, the, the draggy aspect of it all has completely evaporated. And today is one such day.
Yesterday's walk drained all of us. The scorching pavement and those unremarkable villages were sapping our energy. But now, as we approach Galicia, we're seeing increasingly quaint villages and green landscapes. And today's trek from Cagabelos through Villa Franca del Piazzo and on to the tiny village of Ambas Mestas at the foot of the Ancares mountain range has been particu particularly rewarding for one special reason. The river that we crossed time and time again grew smaller as we ascended. Its waters diminishing until upon our arrival at the albergue it had become a small stream. But the stream flows directly in front of Casa Cantadora, which is our albergue for the night. And this small village, one that many pilgrims might overlook in their rush to reach the next stage, or by sticking to the regular stages, the so-called regular stages. This village holds a charm that really should not be missed. These secluded hamlets are the true gems of the Camino, allowing you to really dive into a slower way of life. And Casa Cantadora itself is a marvel in its own right. Knut from Denmark has meticulously renovated this building from 2022 on, adding his tasteful elegance throughout. Just so you get an idea, a bed is 15 euros, a great dinner, vegetarian, is 15 euros, a full breakfast, 10 euros, a half breakfast, five, and there's still plenty to go around. There's a beautiful yoga and meditation room on the top floor, which I'm going to try in a moment. To me, this is such a better way to prepare for the climb of the mountain to Os Ebrero tomorrow than to just run through the village, have a coffee and get going. Here you really mentally and physically prepare. I had a swim in the cold river. It's not super cold, it's 15 degrees, but it definitely freshens you up after a long, warm walk in the sun. And who knows, maybe, why not a morning swim before climbing tomorrow in the heat? So what I found out after getting stopped in my tracks twice was that letting go and not trying to plan your Camino, but just letting it happen. See where it takes you, see where you want to go. It's so much better than having it all set, having everything booked, because it blinds you to the small, beautiful things at the side of the road. And that's exactly the things you don't want to miss because they are what makes the Camino the Camino. There's also less people. It's very intimate. It's very interesting. 
and free floating like this is a whole different way to experience the Camino. You feel free because you are free and it's beautiful. Let's say it like it is. Walking the Camino while sticking to the Brearley stages from the book is easy, supposedly. But you miss out on the best bits of the Camino. And I go as far as to say that your preference for safety precludes you from really experiencing the Camino. I should know, because I've done exactly that. Offstage Camino it is then. Today is marked by the ascent to Osebrero, a beautiful and somewhat demanding hike through lush forests and water, lots and lots of water. The climb ended with a bagpiper officially welcoming us to Galicia and a big lunch.
We went back down the mountain onto Font Freya. But my fellow pilgrim Judith suddenly got a problem with her feet. And so I carried her backpack for the rest of the way. It's not as exhausting as it sounds. And I could feel a little heroic, I guess. We all got together at a great modern albergue in Von Freya. We had an excellent dinner there and a beautiful view and sunset. And the highlight was definitely the cows being brought back into their barn for the night. My antics of getting the picture made for some discussion because um, it was probably not unrisky, but I wanted to get those cows. And also I thought as long as the shepherd or what do you call him, cowboy? I don't know. As long as he was around, it wasn't really that dangerous. And the cow dog was there too. Anyway, it was great. So as always, subscribe, or like, or leave a comment, or all of the above, if you feel like it. And come walk with me on the Camino de Santiago. Ahí estamos alegrando un poco la vida. Claro. Para que se nos haga más ameno el viaje. Digo que para que se nos haga más ameno el viaje. Estamos alegrando un poquito la, el día, la mañana. Para que el viaje, el camino, se nos haga, haga más alegre. Claro, que se note que estamos en Galicia. Eso. Galicia calidad. Sí, eso es. Claro. Muchas gracias. Venga, ánimo que va. Ánimo. Ahora ya estás en Santiago, venga. Cuesta, cuesta. Hasta luego, muchas gracias. The morning landscape of Galicia has to be experienced to be believed. 
is completely quiet except for the sounds of nature. Silence isn't the absence of noise, but the absence of man-made noise. And it seems to be living presence that envelops us. It's a silence that clears the mind, like cotton for the soul. That's very of the cacophony of modern life. The birds, a light breeze, a dog barking somewhere, the quiet allows us to become attuned to the smallest sonic details, like the flutter of a bird's wings or the distant tinkling of cowbells from pastures we can't see. Or the mooing of these cute beasts in their barns. And you see an off-duty farm dog sleeping in the shade, but with half-open watchful eyes just in case. We're walking along farms with their idle tractors and agricultural devices whose usage escapes me. But they are being used. And anyway, where does farm end and village begin? We can smell the earthy scent of damp soil. And there's always the green moss softening the stones. And occasionally an insect flies by closely, and thereby demonstrating your perception of space and sound very well. What we can see here is the eternal dance between nature and the human hands that have shaped it over generations. And it seems like the stone walls and slate roofs of the villages we pass through are not impositions upon the landscape but almost harmonious extensions of it, as if the earth itself had exhaled these structures into being. The slate stone that the buildings are made of remind me of the brittle layers of puff pastry, only more solid. But that's probably because there's a better word for it in French, millefeuille, 
which literally means a thousand sheets. And the resting tractors aren't just machines, but statues of steel, of the labor and perseverance that have sustained these communities for ages. And it becomes very clear that we're just temporary visitors in this ancient landscape. But we're also linked to the cycles of nature that have played out here for eons. But try as I might, my videos and photos or words can't possibly capture this immersive experience. You have to experience it to believe it. And you don't even have to believe it. You just have to experience it. That's a Galician morning for you. And then the path takes us through a small dilapidated village called San Cristovo do Real. And this village is defined by the small tributaries of the forming river. The water comes from all directions and goes around and underneath the houses. It's a village made of water streams. And yet signs of life are rare these days. It's decaying facades or just layered bricks or stones and roof tiles sliding into disrepair. Serve as kind of a reminder that whatever we build are only sand castles before the relentless tides of entropy. The water and time will eventually claim this village back. The stones will be dislodged and the walls will crumble until eventually the village is fully subsumed once more into nature's eternal continuum. Given enough time, these small streams will be eating away at the village's foundations. and claim its stones for its own riverbed. Here are the forces that will one day raise even the mightiest of cities are playing out on an intimate scale. We're an insignificant speck in a cosmic choreography.
And yesterday we walked upstream to find the river getting smaller and smaller. Today we can witness the formation of a river. So it's in reverse this time. We walk from the source to the river. As we walk, we pass many small trickles out of the rocks, or tributaries, like the embryonic gurgles of a river that's not yet born. And then they start converging and eventually form a wide and powerful rapid. And this spectacle, too, is on the order of geological timescales. Who would have thought that I would have some of the best chocolate croissants ever in the tiny town of Samos? And as an international connoisseur of chocolate croissant, pain au chocolat, or Napolitanos as they're called here, those three giant specimens got me well on my way for a walk across the beautiful forest of Galicia. I rolled into town yesterday without having booked anything. And I have to admit, I like that slight tingle of excitement, not knowing if and where I will find something to sleep that day part of, of the whole thing and I'm enjoying it and since I'm doing the off-stage Camino now I will just walk right through Saria. Saria is the town where you can do a short Camino or start a short Camino. It's about 100 kilometers from Santiago so lots of people start there and it becomes a bit of a different Camino. I know that I will have an ice cream there because there's a good ice cream shop. And I will leave it in my wake real quick. I'm sorry, Saria. I'm so sorry.
I'm now walking through the town of Saria, which is where the Camino changes a bit of its character. And that's just how it is. The kilometers are dropping fast now. We will soon go down to double digit remaining kilometers and many will celebrate by the 100 kilometer remaining sign but I will not because it also means the Camino is nearing its end my consolation is that I will most likely walk on to Fisterra and or Muxia, Muxia. but still I'm nearer towards the end than to the beginning and that adds a tinge of melancholy to this great adventure and that's why we'll now have an ice cream some sugar will help apart from the green explosion one thing you instantly notice as you cross into Galicia is how the food really makes a jump in quality it seems Galicians take more pride in their food and the making of it than their neighbors to the east do and basically wherever you go it's quite delicious even if it's just a humble cafe or a little restaurant by the side of the road so far the food experiences have been quite outstanding and it gets better as you get closer to the coast Isn't travel all about maximizing the possible number of surprises? And if so, why not increase the odds by taking the path that's not the regular one? Because most likely, more surprises of the positive kind is what will happen and walking the complementary path from Saria is one of those positive surprises and the funny thing is I don't even know where this alternative path leads to I 
I know it will converge eventually. But where? And where am I going to sleep tonight? I do not know. It is now past four o'clock. And for Camino walking, it's almost like anything after four is the magic hour. Because there's almost no one around. It's quiet and beautiful. So as I expected, the two paths have now converged. But it's so late in the day that there's no one around. Even that cafe in Petroskala, kind of one of the first stops outside of Saria, where people usually go and have their first coffee on their Saria to Santiago adventure. No one. Empty. Nice walk. Beautiful. Day 31, and it's yet another ridiculously beautiful morning. Look at the morning fog that's covering the landscape and the rays of sunshine cutting through the trees and the fog. And this 
epic landscape. I remember walking from Saria as being an ant procession full of people. And now, because I'm doing off stage Camino, there's literally no one. It's a completely different experience. No crowds, no loud chatter, just a quiet, beautiful morning. It almost seems like it's an off-season Camino because even the cafes are closed. It's just there's no one around. And yet I'm in the busiest month. I see no one and I see no coffee that's open. It's It's totally weird and funny. Hey! Yeah, hey! Hey, friend! And then I stumbled upon this nice Dutch lady who made these little, I don't know what you call them, totems that you could pick. And mine said, obstacles don't block the path, they are the path. And uh, when I look at my Camino, that pretty much sums it up. Because a Camino, like life itself, is not a smooth, unobstructed road to glory, or whatever you want to call it. It's a constant set of challenges, a series of metaphorical mountains to climb, also some deep valleys to traverse and to embrace the obstacles as the path itself is to recognize that struggle and growth are intertwined it is the resistance that forges 
the resolve. It's the adversity that builds our armor of wisdom and resilience. So she definitely gave me the right saying that very much applies to my Camino and probably to many other things as well. What are you doing here? Why are you naked? Mes amours. <laughs> The non-booking lifestyle didn't quite work out yesterday as all the albergues on the way were booked. And so consequently, I had to walk the entire way to Palace de Rey, a town best avoided in my opinion. But c'est la vie. And it also meant we joined the throngs of Camino, let's say, short form tourists today, with buses ferrying people from stop to stop. It's sometimes a bit of a farcical scene, selfies and all, but I pass no judgment, officially. Still, there was an upside, because a restaurant I wanted to try for the last two years at the entrance of Melide, but was always closed, was finally open. And they rarely eat octopus, because they are such remarkable creatures. But once a year, I will have to. And so I did, and it was good. And once again, taking the Camino's complimentary variant proved more beautiful and virtually deserted. No crowds, beautiful landscape, very rural, and I have to say, the complementary variants have so far never disappointed. So that's about it. That's all I have to say.
discussing the Saria to Santiago five-day pilgrims is a controversial topic and I often face criticism for doing so. But I feel compelled to share my observations all the same. Starting shortly before Arzua today, the crowds of Camino tourists were unavoidable. These are my honest thoughts and opinion on the matter. To be clear, I obviously make exceptions for those who, for whatever reason, are only able to walk from Saria to Santiago, like the blind couple. Witnessing that is truly beautiful. Some are unable to physically walk longer distances, and the Camino has been a lifelong dream for them. And it's great if they manage to complete the five days, fulfilling their dream. And it goes without saying that groups of Spanish school children that are here to visit their great country are exempt from my thoughts here. But when I see buses ferrying people and luggage from one stop to the next, it rubs me the wrong way. The Camino has, in this section at least, turned from a sacred journey and become commodified and repackaged as a travel experience. And as the trail swells with those seeking selfies rather than spiritual growth, the pilgrimage risks being tainted by the influence of tourism. And yet, who am I to judge the motivations of these latter-day pilgrims? The Camino, like all paths of enlightenment, lies open to any soul. But there is a dissonance, a clash of intentions, when the hallowed and the hedonistic follow the same yellow arrows. Buses disgorge flocks of travelers who resemble sightseers more than seekers of truth. Their tiny day packs carry maybe sunscreen and snacks, leaving no room for the self-reflection and the hardship that shape a pilgrim's journey. They mostly march in impenetrable groups chattering incessantly, oblivious to the quiet contemplation the Camino demands. The cafes on this section are sometimes huge enterprises, overflowing with people, blasting loud music, selling silly souvenirs, and everyone is in line for a stamp in their pilgrim passport which is patently ridiculous. Most have tiny backpacks, but many are carrying nothing, absolutely nothing. And good luck passing the large groups as they take up most of the space, mostly move very slowly and randomly, and their trekking poles are going off in all directions sometimes inadvertently aiming right for your eyes. Sure, everybody walks their own Camino, and that's just fine. But most of the tourists aren't walking the Camino. They are part of an organized travel group, and in my book, that is tourism. Walking on the same path as a pilgrimage does not make one a pilgrim. Walking parts of the Camino on an organized tour is a long walk. And you can take all the selfies you want and collect all the stamps you feel you should. But it isn't a pilgrimage. Collecting cafe stamps for the credentials is like children collecting football championship stickers. 
It's like seeking a sense of accomplishment without enduring the true hardships of the pilgrimage. Tour groups treating this millennia-old ritual as little more than extended walking holiday, where is the exploration, the struggle to cast off life's inessential burdens, the total immersion in the simple act of placing one foot before the other until the mind, too, falls in step with the body's rhythm? And on this hill, I will die. This isn't a pilgrimage. This is tourism, a pastiche of a pilgrimage. Perhaps I romanticize the Camino, viewing it through my rose-tinted lens of my own journey. Yet is there not a sanctity in upholding the essence of this pilgrimage? Sometimes it seems that the only penance is parting with tourism dollars. Then again, who's to say enlightenment cannot be found in unexpected places? The Camino has long been a choose-your-own-adventure tale, where each pilgrim writes their own spiritual narrative, no path more valid than the other. In this light, the selfie-snapping tourists are merely pilgrims of a different order, maybe seeking the same human truths as a better backpacking brethren. Who am I to judge which is the more authentic path? And yet, there's something almost profane about treating this ancient rite as just another travel experience to be booked and stamped off. A pilgrimage demands totality, a willingness to shed all distractions, to walk until the mind, too, joins the body in its journey, transcending the physical into the metaphysical. Can the state be achieved and guided by its sized chunks? Perhaps the very act of walking the Camino, no matter the duration or depth of intention, is enough to part the veils of our everyday lives. Now perhaps there are depths of insight unlocked only through full immersion that these brief pilgrims will forever miss. As I pass the tour groups, I can't help but wonder if their experience is akin to reading the cliff notes on enlightenment, a Camino light. They walk the path, but can they truly understand its essence? Or is the Camino's magic accessible only to those who surrender fully to its rigors, letting the journey unmake and remake in its crucible? In the end, perhaps there is no singular authentic pilgrimage, only a spectrum of experiences as varied as the humans who undertake them. My role, of course, is not to be a gatekeeper, but to celebrate the diversity of paths that lead one way or another to truth, or whatever it is you're looking for. The Camino is just a mirror, reflecting back the deepest yearnings of those who walk. And if they're seekers of pomp and selfies, or if they are looking for the silence between each footfall. Everyone walks their own Camino. And we're not supposed to judge, and I know I'm judging here, but judging is what people do. We're not saints. And seeing these travel groups definitely taints the experience somewhat. Which is why walking on to Fisterra is a great idea for the purity of the walk. into Santiago. There's only about 10 kilometers left to the Plaza de Obradero in Santiago, to Compostela. 
the end for many Caminos. And I look forward to it with both a sense of excitement, but also a sense of dread because this is definitely going to be a partial end to a beautiful and exhausting journey. But for now I'm still walking and I'm walking through the forest that a year ago I walked by moonlight without a flashlight. It's different walking during the day. My friend Judith sprayed her ankle on the last kilometers yesterday. It's just one of those Camino things. So now Roger and I are taking turns carrying her backpack because taking a taxi for this last bit is out of the question. And this is one way to make it work. The shared burden of carrying an extra backpack is nothing compared to enduring the pain of a sprayed ankle. Okay, yeah. Last year, when I arrived on the big plaza at the cathedral, exhausted after 24 hours of walking, and all by myself, it was a very strange, mixed emotion kind of thing. Walking 100 kilometers in one go is good for your ego in a way, but it's also bad. It was a necessity at the time, and that's why I did it. But this year is different. This year, I will take even greater pleasure walking into town with friends and knowing that many of the friends I've made on this Camino will be arriving today as well. And that's a very sweet thing to look forward to. Bittersweet also because some of us might see each other for the last time. But I also know that some of these friendships are for life. What is it that makes the Camino so intense? What other experience is there that gives you a five week long Highly intense physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual experience. What other experience indeed can offer such a sustained and multifaceted intensity? The relentless demands of the trail and the ever-shifting landscapes of the soul are like a furnace that strip away the superficial layers of your existence, leaving you raw and exposed to the elemental forces that shape your world. And with each blister or aching muscle or 
strained ankle or just pure exhaustion, you are reminded of the fragility of the human form. But at the same time, you so often get to taste that sweet nectar of resilience. The Camino is like a splatter painting of contrasts, of pain and joy. solitude and camaraderie, of doubt and epiphany. And as the kilometers fade behind you, the Camino almost reveals itself as a metaphor for life itself, of a journey fraught with challenges and uncertainties, but just as rich with amazing opportunities. for growth and discovery. Maybe in the end, the Camino is a paradox. A physical journey that transcends the material realm. It's both a solitary quest, but that also creates unbreakable bonds. A crucible of intensity that ultimately leads to a profound sense of peace and clarity. It is one of those endeavors where mind and soul and body have to work together to get where you want to be. And they do. And that's also why the long time it takes is a requirement. This kind of thing doesn't happen in a week or two. It takes its time, as it has to. I'm not nearly done with thinking about what the Camino is. These are just some rough thoughts. I think there's a lot more there. But this is what I'm thinking as I'm approaching Santiago. That even as a cow barn, eight kilometers outside of the center. Think about that.
this being my third walk into Santiago. Every Camino I did was amazing in its own right, very special. Well, this one seemed particularly intense on many levels, which is, of course, a good thing. I plan on walking on to the end of the world, to Finisterre and Musha, because that to me is the real goal, but it is still contingent on a few things. But yeah, I'm not done. Roger, this extremely kind and charming and funny man from the Netherlands, who had walked the Camino for 1,700 kilometers all the way from Vézelay and had seen all the beautiful bits of the Camino in France and in Spain, said that this last leg of 20 kilometers that we walked today was his most beautiful leg of the entire Camino. He said, because this was about friendship, because we shared the burden of carrying our friend's backpack, this was his most intense and beautiful piece of the Camino. And I think these words sum it up better than anyone else could. So thank you, Roger, for that, and also Thank you for sharing the burden of carrying that backpack.
Camino Diaries epilogue and Fisterra. I was 20 kilometers into my walk to Fisterra or Finisterre that I made the executive decision to cut it short and take the bus for various personal reasons. I love the walk these four days to the ocean. But sometimes something's got to give, and that is now. It's all right. I've had an incredibly intense and rewarding Camino to Santiago. And maybe adding another icing on the cake may just prove too much. And this also means I can still enjoy the beautiful village of Finisterre which I really, really like. I just walked from the village to the lighthouse, which is the actual end of the world, or the edge of the world, or the end of the walk, depending on your perspective. I was in the deep whirlwind of thoughts and emotions as I was walking up here trying to make some sense of the extraordinary adventure I've just been on. Not with a sense of achievement, but with a deep gratitude for the incredible adventure that I just went through. This will take some time. I'm going to look at my notes here that I took in order to collect some of the thoughts that I had. I'm sitting on a rock near the lighthouse overlooking the ocean. I don't know if you can hear it in the background. There's some wind and some swallows flying around. I had set out on the Camino seeking an internal experience and I received far more than I had bargained for. And although I was unaware of any specific need or issue to work through, the Camino seemed determined to challenge me in ways I had not anticipated. And unraveling the precise nature of these challenges will without a doubt take time and introspection. But it's just a walk, you say, albeit a long one. How could a long walk have an impact this massive? Because it does. It's all that time spent simply walking outside for hours each day exposed to the elements, the sun, the wind, the rain, using your body, your mind, using your soul and your heart in a daily rhythmic dance. It takes two to three weeks to really get into the walking swing of things until your body has adjusted and your mind has settled on this new routine. A 
And the first two to three weeks were in transition. I was reset not once, but twice, by injury and illness. But these resets, in hindsight, were necessary to really set the right path for my Camino. Someone told me in Leon, after over four days of gastrointestinal misery, your Camino is only starting now. And that proved to be entirely true. It wasn't easy until it was. So though initially challenging, the experience gradually became almost effortless, as if it was a natural state of being. And in this state, the constant barrage of choices that typically paralyzes the mind what to wear, what to do, what to decide on today, faded into insignificance. It just didn't matter. Your focus becomes an entirely different one. Normally you accumulate things. More stuff. On the Camino, you don't. On the contrary, you slowly lose them. And it doesn't matter. So you move with less baggage, so what? I'm a news and information junkie, and I thought it would be hard for me to not do the usual. Read everything I can, spend hours on Twitter or X. But to my surprise, I found myself practically offline for five weeks. And the world seemed to carry on just fine without my constant attention. This total immersion in the present moment, this one thing, was a liberating experience. My videos have become so slow that unless there's some motion in the leaves from the wind, you could almost not see there were moving images and not still photos. Like micro expressions in a person's face that we are very able to read. It's these tiny movements that make a difference between a moving and a still image. Now, the interesting thing about photographs is just as photos freeze a moment in time, our minds fill in the gaps, interpreting what came before and after the captured instant. So my videos are sometimes in that liminal space between video and photo. And that's just fine by me. It's getting quite windy up here. I hope the sound quality doesn't suffer. But if you're by the sea, you're exposed to the wind. The Camino is rich in serendipity, that elusive gift of unexpected delights. Serendipity is liberty. 
but it only gifts itself to you if you open yourself up to it. And that requires a leap of faith, a willingness to let go and to allow life to happen organically. Otherwise, we're afforded only fleeting glimpses of its beauty. The Camino dispenses both pleasure and pain in equal measure. A delicate balance of dopamine and discomfort. It's a journey that forces us to confront our inner selves and maybe even to face the pain we may have been avoiding. As Rilke wrote, do not now look for the answers. They cannot now be given to you because you could not live them. The Camino isn't escapism because it doesn't distract you from something painful. On the contrary, it will eventually force you to face the pain or the light. Probably both. I spend my life thinking about the Camino and when I'm on the Camino, I spend my time thinking about my life. And then again, very often, I don't think about all that much, which feels really good as well. Does the Camino provide answers? Or does it force you to ask the right questions? To me, it's mostly the latter. These birds are great. Answers are easy. It's harder to find the right questions. I often hear the Camino is the people you meet. And to me, that's largely true. It's what makes the Camino so special beyond the actual walk. The friendships you forge can be forever. And you get to know your new friends pretty well fast. You're on an adventure together after all. But who you also meet is you. The most profound encounter is with ourselves. The Camino strips away our defenses, forcing us to confront our true selves, warts and all. Knowing ourselves and all our complexity is a gift that transcends the physical journey. The mind empties of its usual clutter as the body's rhythms take over. The armor of the ego slips away until one is stripped bare before the elements. Exposed not just to the sun and wind, but to one's own unvarnished essence. In the end, 
the Camino is a mirror reflecting back our real selves and the cadence of the walk becomes a walking meditation. In this state of bodily struggle and mental calm, the self can no longer hide behind its typical defenses and distractions. We encounter our true nature reflected back at us. Flaws, fears, and insecurities rise to the surface. But so too do hidden reserves of strength, resilience, and wisdom that may have been obscured by the noise of daily life. It's as if the soul is experiencing a condensed evolution. The Camino's power lies in this distillation of the human experience into its most elemental form, one of brute physicality and profound introspection. It's almost a return to our most primal state as wandering nomads, stripped of some of the trappings of modernity without the diversions of work, technology, or material comforts. We're finally able to confront the most important question, who am I? Like Paul Weller sings in Cosmos, who am I, what am I, where am I to go? The eternal question. It's a pilgrimage not just to a physical destination, but also a voyage of self-discovery, a bit of an odyssey into the depths of our own being. The Camino itself becomes a metaphor for the journey of life with its ups and downs, challenges, and revelations. The Camino is you.